Hello, I'm Amara Razgis, and I'm with Consulting Specifying Engineer. We're here today with two subject matter experts to discuss the topic of chillers and chilled water systems. Eric Taylor and Ben Weigend are both technical managers from Henderson Engineers and both have several years of experience on chillers and chilled water systems. Ben, could you please take a moment to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, thanks, Amara. Um, my name is Ben Weigens. I've been with Henderson for uh, uh, over eight years now, 15 years in the, in the industry. Um, we work in our sports and venue sector as a technical manager, as you mentioned. That, that, to that test, that means I'm, I'm kind of overseeing our projects, uh, some an aspect of quality control, but it also means that I'm down in the weeds on a lot of our designs as well. So chiller plant design, um, everything from sports stadiums to arenas. Uh, we did we, you know, SoFi Stadium out in LA, lots of the arenas in California as well. And then various training facilities throughout the country has been kind of our focus. Absolutely. So I'm Eric Taylor, um, been with Henderson for 15 years now, um, primarily with our venue group. As Ben said, we do a lot of sports, um, you know, arenas and stadiums. We also get involved with um, larger venues such as convention centers and airports, um, basically wherever people gather, right? So you can imagine with these, these large complex facilities, um, a lot of times we run into central plants. And, and like we're talking about today, um, a major component of that is chill water and chillers. Um, we do a good amount of work, not only with, you know, standalone pro facilities, but we do a lot of university work. Um, and so through that avenue, um, venue and university has, has been able to, um, you know, drive a lot of the um, industry standards. And, and we'll talk about a little bit of that today. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Let's get started right away. Um, ben, I'm going to shoot this first question over to you. Um, decarbonization and full electrification are moving from buzzwords to concepts, and they're being legitimately discussed and debated on a large percentage of new project opportunities. Um, so really beyond the more obvious fossil fuel fired building heating technologies, how does a building's cooling system play into those goals and aspirations? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I, we're only going to kind of scratch the surface here. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about some broad, broad, um, broad topics and some of the systems that we that we like to apply in these in these applications. The idea here is that we are no longer trying to treat the chilled water system as a chilled water system and the heating water system as a heating water system. We want we want all of the building systems um, to kind of function together, to dovetail together, so that we can move heat throughout the building, as opposed to uh, trying to generate these systems, these things um, separately. So you can't really you know, fossil fuels. It's really difficult to get away from. Electrification is a big is a big part of that, but our grid is still very much fossil fuel driven, and so it's it's not enough to just say, okay, well, I'm not going to use a gas fired boiler. I'm going to use a, an electric an electric boiler. Um, that's an improvement. It's put you on the grid, but it's also um, still just the best efficiency you can get from that is is one. I put in a kW and I get a kW out for heat. So what what we've been trying to do is to take our more traditional chiller plants and dovetail them, combine them. Um, you know, cross cross pollinate and and generate heating water at the same time as chilled water. So, rather than rejecting all of our heat to a cooling tower, we're going to reject heat to the heating water system, and we're going to reject heating. You know, we're going to reject heat to the to the domestic hot water system or to very any other place in the building that needs heat. And at the same time, we're going to look for places that need um, that re that that also reject heat, and we're going to use those sources as well. Or if they're if they need heat, we're going to be a heat source for them as well. And that can be refrigeration, um, data racks, and communication systems. So there's any number of ways we can try and pull these things together. But at the end of the day, the idea is to move heat as opposed to generating heat. And so these heat pumps that we use, they can be just a, just an air source heat pump by itself is on the order of magnitude of two to three times as efficient. As a uh, as a as an electric boiler, for instance, but then you you pair that with the chilled water system. Now now we're now we've got these two things that are both two to three times as efficient, and we're combining them, so we're in the you know four to six times as efficient as we could have been uh, on a really good day. And there's and there's various other things. Like I said, we're just barely scratching the surface, but that's that's kind of the bigger concepts that we're that we've been trying to see trying to use as strategies to achieve not just electrification and decarbonization, but also energy reduction. 
Absolutely. And, and kind of like Ben talked about, we're, we're not just looking at chillers alone or boiler systems alone in, in terms of, of electrification decarbonization. We are really trying to look at a hybrid approach and how we can pull those systems together and, and benefit both of them um, as we look at these different technologies and these different um, challenges that, that are being um, brought up today. Okay, thanks. And Eric, let me follow along kind of that same line of thought. Um, decarbonization and full electrification don't by themselves remove stress um, on stressed or aging utility infrastructure. So what trends are you seeing in chiller and chilled water system design that can pull down historical loading or work toward easing that stress on utility grids? Absolutely. Um, you know, something that we take pride in is we want to look at the building holistically. Like we don't want to just look at the chiller system and just look at a boiler system and just look at this system by itself. Um, we want to look at things as a whole. And so through that process, we not only try to identify how to make things most efficient, we try to identify how we can um, set them up to, you know, minimize run times or, you know, maximize um, the efficacy of a system operation. So a couple of the things that we look in for these venue type projects is displacement ventilation. Um, that's something that's not new to the industry, um, but it's something that's a, a bit newer maybe to say a sports facility. Um, we are lucky to have a um, NBA arena um, and a couple other arenas that are, that are in the works that actually utilize under seat displacement ventilation um, for an arena bowl. And we're talking, you know, 18 to 20,000 seat arena bowls. Um, where we benefit from that is in a traditional um, bowl setup where you're supplying air from overhead, you may require, you know, anywhere from 24 to 36 hours of what we call pre-cool in order to get that space preconditioned in order to prep it for, you know, that 18 to 20,000 people to arrive. Well, the beauty about a displacement system is we can actually turn that system on, you know, 30 minutes to an hour before an event and still maintain temperatures and maintain conditions throughout that event. So just by looking at air side systems and, and treating those a little bit different and reducing the overall load on the building, we are then reducing the overall energy efficiency of the, or the overall energy usage of the building. A um, couple other things that we look at um, that are potential solutions for, for minimizing energy usage um, in relation to chillers <laughs> is thermal storage, you know, whether that be the ice storage or, or cold water storage. Um, we look at series counterflow setups or high delta T's. By increasing the delta T of our chill water system, we can minimize pumping um, uh, pumping energy requirements. Um, we can minimize pipe sizing and initial first cost. Um, we look at water side economizers. Um, how do we build those into the system such that the water side economizer is integrated and we can get a benefit from that on a, a more regular basis versus only when the outsider conditions allow for it. When, when can we tie those systems together to get a little bit of benefit all the times? Um, and then in the end, we are, you know, we're trying to take all these different technologies and solutions and tie them together and make them work together to provide the best overall and um, you know most efficient solution for an owner. Yeah, I just uh, tag onto that a little bit. Using a you know, having a chilled water heating water a four pipe system, uh, it was something that people thought was kind of on its way out. They thought um, we're going to go VRF or DX, so that's you know variable refrigerant volume variable refrigerant flow. Um, there was these other technologies where they could move heat around a building. They would kind of do what I was talking about, but the chilled water and heating water solution gives us the ultimate flexibility. I have much more custom type equipment that we can, we can use. We can do this displacement ventilation system because we have chilled water and heating water. And if we are making the chilled water more efficiently and then we're using the chilled water more efficiently, then those solutions end up with a product that uses less energy. Absolutely. Interesting. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, ben, totally changing gears here. What, what's, what's something that you're seeing today as it relates to owner requests or building operational needs for these chilled water systems? Something that wasn't there a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. So um, in speaking more specifically about sports and venues, since that's kind of where we, where we live, our, that's our home. Um, one of the areas, one of the big areas that we're seeing a lot of a lot of a trend uh, is is with emergency cooling. Something that you would have normally only been you would have only seen in a in a hospital or a um, uh, critical mission critical data centers that kind of thing. Uh, now we're starting to see these venues. You know, 
I, I have 80,000 people in these seats and we need to take care of them and I don't want them to necessarily leave. Can we keep things running during a power outage long enough to where we can bring things back up and get the game going or whatever it is that's going on the match, um, get everybody there, keep everybody there, keep the place, I mean, keep the place running and profitable and, and our operators happy. So trying to find ways um, besides just putting everything on emergency power, that's always one option, obviously, but trying to find creative ways to keep things running. So what we've done in, in, a, uh, in a few places uh, in, in several stadiums is uh, using our chilled water as a, as a flywheel. So uh, the chilled water system continues to run, temperature obviously rises because the chillers aren't making water anymore. And then it, at, at some point, the critical equipment turns into heat pump equipment and it rejects heat back to that, back to that loop. So that's one area that we've seen um, be kind of a, a new trend is trying to figure out creative ways, you know, it, 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 we can start to, to bump up from there. So if that's not enough, then we, then we start talking about, okay, do we need to put a cooling tower on emergency power? And, oh, is that not enough? Okay. Now, now we need to start talking about putting a chiller on emergency power, but trying to find that right fit um, is definitely <laughs> something that's been a, a big push. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and to kind of build on what Ben talked about, it's it's not just, okay, we need emergency cooling, let's go put a chiller and a bunch of pumps and cooling towers on emergency power. It's it's how do we, you know, accommodate the owner's request, whether it's, you know, we want to maintain a two hour event, or we want to protect our, you know, um, coolers and freezers for two days, um, or we want to protect our, um, you know, sensitive electronic equipment in DAS rooms or IT rooms. We want to be able to protect that for a certain amount of time. So, you know, we work a lot with the owners and operators to understand what they're looking for, what they need, and then work through a lot of different concepts and how to approach that. Again, we're not just looking to put a chiller on emergency power, what other avenues can we take? You know, can we utilize heat pumps and, and turn that chill water loop into a condenser water loop and utilize heat pumps um, during that emergency operation? So, and then there was one other, uh, one other big, big trend that we're noticing that's used, it's, it's not a new trend necessarily, but in the last five years, it's gained a lot of traction and that's water reduction. Um, it used to be just in the more drought prone areas of the country, California, the more arid climates, water reduction was a, was, is a huge deal. They, they don't have a lot of it, but it's become, you know, everybody's very, it's sort of slowly, but everybody's realizing water is not an, a, a resource that we have that's infinite. And if we don't take care of it, we're going to have issues. And so part of what I kind of talked about uh, a little earlier was using the use of heat pumps and things like that, air source heat pumps what those can do. So if I'm rejecting heat to a heat pump or rejecting heat to a heat pump chiller, I'm no longer having to reject that heat to a cooling tower. And if I'm not rejecting heat to a cooling tower, that means I'm using less water. And so I'm trying to figure out how I can use as little water as possible. And then we work with our plumbing design groups and our civil partners, uh, you know, the various civil engineers we work with to try and figure out, okay, now I'm, now I'm using as little water as possible. Can I get that water somewhere that didn't come from a, a, a treatment plant, that didn't come from a reservoir or, uh, you know, a, a, a lake, a sort of, you know, water, natural water source. Can we figure out a way to use water that's coming from the building or water that's coming from the storm system to, to use in the cooling tower? So reduce it and then find another source has been a really big push uh, nationally. And, and, and it's it's grown like wildfire, I think, in the last five years. Yeah, absolutely. The the even the on-site treatment of water, like Ben said, and being able to, um, you know, spend a little money up front, a little maintenance in order to, um, you know, create water savings is been something that we've been, you know, evaluating and working with with owners and, and clients on recently, um, whether it's on-site or even using a local utility municipality that provides reclaimed water, um, you know, understanding what that water quality may be, um, you know, what on-site treatment may be required. And, and again, just looking at it from a holistic standpoint, um, what things can we do to help provide, you know, savings from a water standpoint, not just energy, but from a utility standpoint as well. Right. So that's a very holistic and very integrated view. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, we could kind of go on and on. I've got a list here and we got, <laughs> I got like halfway through it. So, but um, I know we have a lot of, a lot of other things to cover as well. So I didn't want to bog us down too much. Yeah, Eric, a, a question for you. So historically, it feels as though increased focus on innovative solutions and sustainability metrics has been equated to increasingly complex solutions for building owners or operators to manage. I mean, this is all post-construction. How can design professionals or engineers best balance those potentially competing interests? 
Absolutely. Um, so that's something actually that that Henderson plays a lot into, and, and honestly, it's very you know personal to me. Is you know not just designing a system that is the best on paper, but is the best in actual operation. So. Um, We take a lot of pride in working with our clients, um, not just the owners, but also their facilities groups and the operator groups. Um, One is to try to understand what what they've learned from, what what issues have they had in the past. And it may not be directly related to some of the topics we're talking about, but you build that relationship and you you try to get that feedback. And we want to um, understand those things. We want to learn from those things. Um, So like you said, looking at technologies to do decarbonization or full electrification or just higher superior efficient systems can lead to more complex systems. You know, we've talked about, you know, hybrid systems or heat recovery systems where you've got chill water and heating water tied together um, where you're, you know, this mode, you're running this system and this, you know, mode of operation versus this mode of operation. And it can get very difficult. Now, um, with building automation systems and and, um, the digital age, there is a lot of computer based, you know, decision making and monitoring that can help with those things. But in the end, if the operator doesn't understand and doesn't buy into the system, then it's very difficult to benefit from from those designs. Um, If you operate these systems in kind of a more traditional standpoint, then you're not getting any of those efficiency gains or efficiency or energy reductions that we designed for. Um, So the things that buy in, buy in, I was going to say buy in is huge. So if we don't get if if we we can design it, we can put anything on paper. But if the if the person who's operating it doesn't doesn't like it, they're not going to run it that way. And so if we can't have that discussion with them, then we're all then the project won't be a success. But we won't if, if they buy in, there may still be some hiccups. There may still be, uh, well, this loop isn't, you know, this loop is not talking to this loop correctly. This this didn't work right. This didn't stage up and down. But but if I had buy-in, now I have an owner and an owner's facilities guy who's willing person, excuse me, uh, facilities person who is willing to talk to me and we can have that discussion and, and enjoy and like we can learn from that. And then I, on the next project, I learned everything from that facilities guy. Absolutely. And it, and it goes back to what I said before is the relationships, right? So if we can work with these people up front and build these relationships up front, then that just makes it stronger on the back end. So after we're done with the design, after construction is done, um, you know, after our commissioning group comes in and make sure that it's set up and and working at least day one properly, um, you know, by building those relationships, they are, they feel free to call us, you know, one, two, five years after the fact and bring those issues up to us. Hey, this isn't working the way we expect or, Hey, this is an issue. What, you know, what's happening here. And we've been able to, um, you know, build a lot, a lot of long lasting relationships with different universities, different clients um, to provide that feedback for them, learn from, you know, not only our own designs, but their past designs. Um, you know, I mentioned a little bit before commissioning, we're, we're very adamant. And, and again, it's, it's being required more and more by different codes or different municipalities, but we're big believers in it, right? You know, the design can only be as good as it is on paper, can only perform as well in real life if it's set up properly and operated properly. Um, a good example I like to give on this is, you know, displacement. You know, we talked a little bit before about using displacement in large arenas. Um, We've run into issues where, you know, they set the set point at 55 degrees because that's what they're used to on air handling systems and not realizing that's actually a detriment to the system. They need to be operating at higher temperatures. So, again, just something that they may not be thinking about. And if we can get in front of that and we can build those relationships, have those discussions up front and educate, then we can all be successful. Yeah, some great insights there. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, I've been speaking today with Ben Weejan and Eric Taylor from Henderson Engineers. Thank you so much for joining us and goodbye.